Warning, the radio broadcast you're about to hear was made by men and for men. It may at times seem a little rough around the edges, brash, and certainly not canonically approved by papal authority. But its content may indeed challenge you to become the man, father, husband God has called you to be. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to another week of The Obligation. My name is Jason Murphy. Thank you once again for joining us. We have been talking over the last couple weeks about heaven and hell. We had Charles Fraun on to discuss the realities of hell and demons' possession last week in a two-part series. And this week, as we approach All Hallows' Eve, also known as Halloween, which is the anticipation of All Saints Day. We also anticipate the day after where we pray for and acknowledge the deceased on All Souls Day. The Feast of All Souls is credited to the Benedictine Monastery of Cluny in France in the year 993 AD. And since its establishment, it has grown to become one of the most solemn and venerated days in the Catholic Church. And on this day, the church allows each priest to celebrate three requiem masses, one for the specific intention of the priest, the second for the faithful departed, and the third for the Holy Father's intentions. This was established back in the year 1915 by Pope Benedict XV and has never been changed. This is also one of three times throughout the year that the priest can wear black vestments, Of course, at funerals, the priest is allowed to wear black vestments, and also on Good Friday, so on All Souls Day, the black vestments are allowed as well to symbolize the mourning and the death of the souls. So this shows the great reverence and belief that the Catholic Church has and takes for the souls in purgatory, um, which solidifies the Church's teaching on purgatory. The Catechism of the Catholic Church states that all who die in God's grace and friendship but still imperfectly purified are indeed assured of their eternal salvation. But after death, they undergo purification so as to achieve the holiness necessary to enter the joy of heaven. That's from the Catechism of the Catholic Church 1030. So we have a strong history, strong belief Uh, that is continually uh, solidified by the Church's teaching and implementation of this great feast of all souls that unfortunately has become overlooked um, these days due primarily of the world's perspective of Halloween, um, which of course is the day before all saints and even further washed out uh, the day after for all souls. I think they they sometimes get combined, people overlook them, but I think it's very important for us to remember that, uh, and referring back to my conversation with Charles uh, last week, you know, he he stated, you know, of course, you know, we will soon be those souls, and that, of course, is the slogan of the Knights of Columbus, Tempus Fugit Memimo Morti, which is translated, time flies, remember death, and I don't think... Many of us these days uh, take enough time to reflect on death, and that is so much more the reason why we should try and reestablish this, especially within our families, um, bringing our kids with us to the cemetery to pray for the dead. It will certainly uh, bring out conversations. I know this past week I took a road trip with five of my oldest children, and we traveled to Louisiana. Uh, to spend a few days with family and uh, a few, you know, fall events that they have there. And one of uh, the check and one of the stops on our list were to stop at the cemetery where they could see the memorial stone that was placed for my father who passed away in March of 2021. They are, 
used to going cemeteries because for the past several years we have gotten together um, as a family and we will go and pray a rosary for the souls of the faithful departed in the cemetery. So they're now used to being in the cemetery. It's not anything that is taboo for them. I know for me, that was not something that I was used to as a kid. The only times that I was ever at a cemetery was for a funeral or passing by one or maybe in my late teens, you know, stopping in there and uh, trying to spook friends or, or be spooked. So I think, you know, having the young children be able to be in that, uh, having the young children able to ask questions and be present for that, it takes away the uh, strangeness of cemetery and and makes it more of a a reality and a place for questions and growth and uh, and that's important. We need to be mindful of death. We need not be scared of death, and we need to be aware that death will come to all of us, and that is why it is so important for us to live good, holy Christian lives. While we stopped in uh, to the cemetery in Baton Rouge to pay respects to my father. The children asked about purgatory, and we discussed the importance of praying for their souls because they pray for us. And they can't, you know, according to many beliefs, that they cannot pray for themselves, that they rely on the mercy of the faithful that are still living, the church militant, to pray for them. And they, we consider the church suffering. And of course, they are suffering with hope. Because there is hope for them that one day, through prayers and the purgation of purgatory, they will receive their eternal reward in heaven. You know, and this is, you know, of course, very different than the suffering that goes on in hell, which is eternal suffering and no hope, where all hope, where all hope is lost. So it's very important. Charity is, therefore, it is a very important act of charity for us to pray for the souls of the faithful departed. And often pray for those who have no one else to pray for them and those who are long forgotten. So it's important, you know, making a visit to the cemetery, not only to visit those we know, but to also visit those who we don't know. Visiting some of the oldest graves in there, because maybe there's no one else alive, they're able to pray or remember them. So important to recognize the names and pray specifically with specific intentions for these souls. We don't know the state of all of the souls in the cemetery, but we can only pray with hope that perhaps we can help free some of them from their suffering so that they will may enter heaven, and therefore they will be able to pray and assist God and His holy will for us so that one day we too can leave this world and enter the kingdom of heaven. Many different cultures celebrate differently, but uh, all tied very similarly to the same idea. In Mexico, All Souls Day is a national holiday, and it's called Dia de los Muertos, is the Day of the Dead, where many people believe that the spirits of the dead return to enjoy a visit to their friends and relatives on this day. And then long before sunrise, people stream into the cemeteries laden with candles, flowers, and food that is often shaped and decorated to resemble the symbols of death. So in the United States, the Dia de los Muertos is celebrated in in certain areas uh, with higher concentration of Mexican or Hispanic uh, heritage. You know, Los Angeles is a large uh, one, for example. So the day is filled with music and festivities and dancing, and this is to uh, reflect the fact that the dead enjoyed life and they don't want to be remembered in mourning or sadness but they want to be celebrated in a way that recognizes death as a natural part of the human experience and a continuum with birth, childhood, and growing up to become contributing members of society and, of course, uh, members of the church. So the most familiar symbol of Dia de los Muertos may be the calicas and the calaveras. They're the skeletons and skulls which appear everywhere during the holiday. There's uh, candied sweets, as uh, parade masks and dolls, and the Calicus and the Calaveras are almost always portrayed as enjoying life, often in fancy clothes and entertaining situations. So there's a there's a balance there. You know, we certainly don't want to overlook the fact that the dead are in a place of suffering, especially those who've made it to purgatory and they need our prayers. 
However, it is also uh, important not to always think of our deceased as sad and lonely and missing <clears throat> out on life. For we know that uh, life is suffering in many ways. There's a lot of joys, but we must celebrate those who lived holy and virtuous lives in a way that they certainly conquered death as Christ did and through their joys, sufferings, and accomplishments, they have attained heaven as well. Of course, there's also the other side that will say that everyone goes to heaven, and we certainly know that not everyone goes to heaven if we believe uh, what our Lord teaches in Scripture. In the book of Luke chapter 6, likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then, by their fruit you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So this is one of several very strong statements from our Lord that we believe as Catholics, not all go to heaven. We have to work out our salvation with fear and trembling each day in all of our conversations, relationships, and choices that we must make each day to follow our Lord or to not follow him. And we know this is a very difficult path sometimes, sometimes very clear, sometimes not so very clear. But even St. Paul, uh, in the book of Romans, he states, Brothers and sisters, I know that good does not dwell in me, that is, in my flesh. The willing is ready at hand, but doing the good is not. For I do not do the good I want, but I do the evil I do not want. Now, if I do what I do not want... It is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. So then I discover the principle that when I want to do right, evil is at hand. For I take delight in the law of God in my inner self, but I see in my members another principle at war with the law of my mind, taking me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Miserable one that I am, who will deliver me from this mortal body? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So St. Paul, who is one of my absolute favorite writers of Scripture, speaks so clearly about the continual struggle that we have as humans, especially if we are on the path that uh, leads to heaven and we're fighting against our flesh, the world, and the devil. St. Paul says that the just man sins seven times, and we know, Lord knows, we have uh, many more struggles than that and perhaps more sins than that each day. It's a continual battle. We know that we're, if we're trying to do good and we're aware of that, we know that we are at war. And that is why the church refers to the souls still living on earth as the church militant, because we are at war with the world, the flesh, and the devil. There are eternal consequences for this war, and it's made up of many small battles, and those battles are inside each one of our souls. So as a whole, everyone on earth, yes, there is a war of good and evil between our Lord and the devil, and that war is made up of all of the small battles. But we know in the end that our Lord will win and he will triumph. The faithful servants will will serve him faithfully, and the devil will not triumph over them. The devil will hoard and seek out who he may devour, and he will devour some. But please God, we will stick to the teachings of the Catholic Church of our holy faith, and not be led to destruction with him. And that is the great reason why we have that cooperation of faith and prayer between the holy souls and the church militant, so that uh, we may lend a hand to them by prayer and penance, just as we hope they will do for us when the time comes and we are in need. St. Catherine of Genoa a uh, famous saint for her self-sacrificing services to the sick and the poor as well, um, put it this way in her treatise on purgatory. The Almighty is so pure that if a person is conscious of the least trace of imperfection and at the same time understands that purgatory is ordained to do away with such imperfections, 
the soul enters this place of purification, glad to accept so great a mercy of God. The worst suffering of these suffering souls is to have sinned against divine goodness and not to have been perfected in this life. So it is important for us to continually expiate for our sins as well as uh, assisting the souls in purgatory. Uh, there's a an effect for every cause and a cause for every effect. Um, the effect of sin is because of the sin of our first parents, and the effect of our sin now will be purgatory if we are faithful. So we must practice these remembrances of the souls in purgatory. Of course, coming up um, for all souls, we have so many different uh, practices uh, there are candles and memorial masses that we can offer. There are rosary processions and visitations to the cemetery. Uh, we actually have a great opportunity coming up that we've done for about 10 years in Charlotte. Several men, it started through the Knights of Columbus Council 770 at St. Patrick's, and it's continued to grow over the years where we will meet at a local cemetery in Charlotte, uh, Elmwood Cemetery. And the men will meet, and typically Father Rue will be there. He will lead us in the rosary and specific prayers for the souls of the faithful departed. And we will process quietly through the cemetery, reciting the rosary, each man joining in and leading a decade or two. And we'll do that coming up on Tuesday, November 2nd, which thankfully this year it does fall on the Feast of All Souls. Some years it has not fallen on the Feast of All Souls, whether it was on the weekend or just later in the week and inconvenient. But this year it will be a great opportunity. We're going to meet at the gates of the cemetery uh, at 745. And this is Elmwood, again, across from CMPD Division Headquarters on 6th Street. Uh, the address is 700 West 6th Street. And I encourage anyone who's ever... And I encourage anyone who's never done this or anyone who's done this uh, with their family or it's been a while, it's just, it's very impactful to be there with a group of men. Uh, it'll be nighttime, so it'll be dark, and it's very solemn. Walking through, uh, several of the men will have flashlights and will, you know, shine on some of the the gravestones and we'll remember, you know, specifically those names and pray for them <clears throat> while we hope as well that they pray for us. So I encourage you, if you're available, again, November 2nd at the Elmwood Cemetery at 745, and uh, a great opportunity. Not only to pray for the souls of the faithful departed, but also uh, the church allows what is called a plenary indulgence for this act of uh, faith and mercy for the souls in purgatory. A plenary indulgence is granted by the church to remove the temporal uh, punishments for sin. Of course, we go to confession, and the sin and the guilt is removed through absolution, but we are still uh, required afterwards uh, to pay or to to make amends for this sin. However, with a plenary indulgence in certain instances, uh, and there's so many different ways th that the church allows this. Sometimes it's uh, certain novenas. Sometimes it is through uh, certain visitations to certain churches through different periods of time. Maybe it's a holy year. But also uh, this this act of visiting the cemetery is has attached to it a plenary indulgence, which also removes the the punishment for the sin. The word plenary uh, means complete, relating to the complete remission of punishment, and Catholics believe that they receive a partial indulgence by performing any act of charity. The word indulgence comes from the Latin word indulgentia, which means pardon. An indulgent is a gracious pardon or dismissal of the effects of sin. And I believe this is summarized in the prayer of St. Francis of Assisi, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. So I think that is where the crux of the matter is. It is in giving that we receive, and it is in pardoning that we pardoned. 
And that is how these celebrations, these memorials, these prayers of all souls culminate in, in a full circle in the cooperation between the church triumphant, those are the angels, the saints in heaven, the church suffering, those in purgatory, and the church militant, those on earth still in the battle between good and evil. So it's a, it's a continual cooperation of grace and faith uh, between these three categories of, of the church and how important it is to continue this and to make sure we're involved in this. We are at war. We are in the battle for our eternal souls individually. So we must come together. We must be active. We must express our faith, not just in word, but also in deed and in prayer and how much more so by setting an example to our family, to our friends, to our fellow parishioners, that we're actively engaged in this war. And it doesn't have to be a war of dismay and discouragement and sadness, but a war of joy, for we know that we will win with our Lord as long as we walk with him. So if you haven't taken part of any of the All Souls memorials, uh, maybe this year let you know make this make this the year that you try to get back involved or that you try to get involved you know there are so many different ways if you're not able to make the rosary at the cemetery then perhaps offer a mass do a votive mass for of someone in your family or a friend or offer a candle I know we get the envelopes at church that we can write down the souls of the faithful departed and have a candle lit for them Or just stop into the church and light one on your own. It doesn't have to be a public statement. It doesn't have to be known by anyone other than you. Maybe just say a Hail Mary. Maybe say a prayer for someone who has no one else to pray for. There are so many uh, that we could offer prayers for that have simply no one left alive to pray for them. And yet they probably sit there and pray for us. So we want to do what we can to assist the souls in purgatory. For one day it may be us. And one other topic I just briefly wanted to jump into, which I alluded to uh, slightly earlier, was that I took five of my oldest kids on a road trip. Mom stayed at home with the baby, and Dad decided to jump in a, a car and take the five kids down to Louisiana. And it got me to, and it allowed me to reflect of the importance of time with our kids, and not just the time itself, but the quality of the time and the importance of remembering uh, to, and the importance of, and the importance, and the importance of connecting the faith with our recreation time. Because so many times, whether it's vacation or holiday or just a weekend, we just want to sit back, we want to relax and, you know, kick our feet up. Maybe we turn the TV on, maybe we just zone out. Um, maybe we go, you know, into our own room and, and try to pull away from the stressors of life. But on this journey with the kids the past few days, uh, I made sure to remember to pray with them, to encourage them, and to have moments of, of discussions of faith. You know, like I said, we went to the cemetery. We visited, uh, you know, our family at the cemetery and prayed for them. And while we were traveling, we, of course, went to Mass. And on our way back, we stopped through Mobile, Alabama, and we saw, you know, some fun things. We saw the USS Alabama. We went to an aquarium. But a friend of mine also mentioned to stop by the Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception in downtown Mobile. And I'm glad we did. It was a a beautiful cathedral. It was a great learning experience. He mentioned uh, the beauty of all the stained glass windows in the cathedral, and they all were uh, meditations, and they all were images of Our Lady in different at different points of her life. The Immaculate Conception, of course. There was the Assumption, the Crowning of Mary, uh, her sorrows, you know, at the foot of the cross, and and so many others. And so we took. And so I took the kids in, and we took a few moments in quiet prayer and just took a look at the, and just soaked in the beauty of the cathedral and its high barreled ceilings and and rich colors. 
And before we left, we decided to take a walking tour of the the windows. And it was great to stand back and just let the children, you know, try and, and figure out which which window went with which image of Our Lady or which decade of the rosary it symbolized. And stepping back as a father, I was very proud, uh, very proud that they were able to, to, between the five of them, you know, figure out which one it was. Some of them knew right off, and sometimes it took a few minutes and it took a, a couple of hints. But it was just a wonderful day, and I think whenever we fill those spots in our lives and especially when we go away it's for a vacation and we want to pull out of the the day-to-day grind that we have those those moments of faith within them because if we pull out too much uh, we oftentimes overlook the importance of our faith and we want to include all of the somewhat monotonous activities in our life, clump them all in in once. And we have to be very careful with that. You know, mass each Sunday can sometimes become a routine and become a monotonous activity if we're not careful and remember why we're there and who we're there to worship and to honor and to grow with. And we always need to make sure that there's a separation there. You know, we have our work grind. We have our school grind. We've got just the, the frustrations, the toil, the, the daily uh, schedule, in and out and running around, you know, the rat race per se. But we want to make sure that our faith does not get swallowed up in that. And I think that's a trick these days of the devil and of the world to just kind of wash it all out together. And we want to break away from everything, but we need to be careful that we're not uh, forgetting our Lord and, and our holy Catholic faith that we have such an obligation to to live and to fulfill and to teach and encourage our own kids. So in saying that, I would just remind everyone, you know, if you do take a vacation, if you do go out of town, even if it's for a day or a weekend, make sure there's a portion there. You know, maybe say a rosary in the car. It's, it's not difficult, and oftentimes when the car gets really crazy, uh, a nice quiet rosary can sometimes settle everything down. And I know this from experience with, with many of the babies we've traveled with. The rosary and the repetition and the solemnness can oftentimes quiet the baby, and it will certainly calm the kids down. And the kids will grow to appreciate that and even ask for that themselves. So make sure you take that time to include Our Lady and Our Lord uh, in your travels, in your vacations, and make sure that that is uh, always, you know, one one part of your, um, and make sure that is often one part of your recreation, to recreate and recreate your soul. You know, we need that. So when we pull away from the daily day grind, we don't want to pull away from our our practices. We want to strengthen our practices and work on meditation and work on prayer and study and read so that these moments will be a refresher for us so that when we go back to the world, our faith will be uh, strengthened and we'll be able to bring that faith even better to our friends, to our family, to our workplace, and become the men, the fathers, the husbands that we're truly called by God to be. I appreciate everyone tuning in and look forward to speaking to you next week. In two weeks, we're going to bring Charles Fraun back on and spin the wheel of Catholic topics in regards to faith, fatherhood, ethics, heaven, hell, marriage, etc., and answer some of those questions that maybe we just don't ask. So make sure to tune in. That will be the week of November 1st. And of course, registration is still open for the Catholic Men's Conference of the Carolinas 2022 edition on March 5th at St. Thomas Aquinas Catholic Church. Go online and get registered at www.catholicmenofthecarolinas.org. Use the promo code RADIO and save five bucks. And Carolina Catholic Media Network is still in the midst of the fall fundraising pledge drive. If you're enjoying listening to Carolina Catholic Radio and all of the wonderful content and shows that we offer, and by the way, we have more local content than any other Catholic radio network in the nation, If you want to help keep us alive and well and relevant, go online to www.carolinacatholicradio.org. Click that donate button and we would greatly appreciate it. 
for the Catholic Men's Conference of the Carolinas, the Obligation Radio Show, and the Carolina Catholic Media Network. This has been Jason Murphy. God bless and esto bien.